Hello calculus students. Today we're going to talk about inverse derivatives with a focus on trig inverses and how to take the derivative of an inverse function. So let's jump into this. First let's remember how in the world you even find an inverse. If you remember this is from uh, from swapping out the x's and y. So if this is y let's change this to an x equals 5 and then we'll replace the x with a y. So you, re you swap the x's and y's, solve for y and then that's the inverse. So if I add 1 and then I'm going to divide by 5. You'll get this crazy thing, y minus 2 cube, uh, cubed. And then we'll take the cube root of both sides and add 2. So let's just kind of jump to the final answer here. It would be cube root of x plus 1 over 5 plus 2. And then that all equals y. So this right here would be the inverse function of the original 5 times x minus 2 cubed minus 1. Uh, so again, the way we do that is we take an x, y coordinate point and you swap and uh, you swap the x and the y. So it's like this, you change them. And then this here would be the inverse if this is the regular function. Okay, so just a quick review on that. So now, here's some confusing notation that kids get uh, mixed up quite a bit. And that is when we're used to seeing this negative 1 as an exponent, that just means it's 1 over x. You flip it, you make it reciprocal. But if you're talking about a function and you put a negative 1 with the function notation, it means it is the inverse. So this negative 1 and this negative 1 do not mean the same thing. You have to understand the context of the problem to know when it's talking about a reciprocal versus when it's talking about the inverse. Here is uh, something that you'll see right on the front page of an AP exam. That is that when we're talking about trig functions and we want to discuss specifically the inverse of a trig function, it could be written like this here, sine inverse of x, or you could be written as arc sine. These are interchangeable. So if you see them in some of the lesson here, some of the practice, uh, you just got to think if you see arc sine or arc tangent, it just means the inverse function of sine. So don't get confused when you're using the calculator here. If you're just plugging in a sine of x, that's just regular old trig function sine. And then 1 over sine, that is the same thing as cosecant x. Okay, that's 1 over sine versus sine inverse. This is the inverse of sine. This is not 1 over sine, which would be written here. And then 1 over sine inverse, this then, of course, would be the reciprocal function cosecant of x. So this is the inverse of cosecant if you say 1 over sine inverse. Okay, so with all of that quick reviews, let's jump into what in the world an inverse trig function is. Okay, these you just have to memorize. I'm sorry, you got to memorize them. Write these down, and while you're writing, I'm going to tell you some little secrets that I've kind of come up with that, that seems to help me, and it helps quite a bit of students, but you have to participate, so hopefully you're not going to sound foolish by talking out loud. Uh, so, if you have one of these inverse trig functions that start with an s. So you see here you've got an s for the sine and an s for the secant inverse. If they start with s, that means you're going to have subtraction and you're also going to have a square root. So s gives you subtraction and s is also going to give you square root. So that's what you'll look for in these. Notice that in tangent inverse, it does not start with s. There is no square root and there is no subtraction. In fact, it's addition. I also like to think of the t here. I didn't write this down, but the t is kind of looks like a plus sign. And so that helps me remember that this is the, the addition or tangent is addition. Okay, so again, if it starts with an s, it is what? It has subtraction and square root. Okay, then the next thing is if you see sine, see how I can imagine a little number one here for sine, then it's going to start with the number one. So here you have sine, one is first, and then we subtract x squared. Versus secant, it doesn't have that little i in there, so the one comes last. You have the x squared and then the minus one. Uh, tangent, because it is addition, it doesn't matter. You can put the x squared first or the one. It, this would be the same thing if you said, 1 over 1 plus x squared. It's commutative, so the addition doesn't matter which one comes first. Either one works. 
And then the last one, okay, sorry, this might be a little off color for some of you, for your little sensitive, sorry about that. C stands for, oh crap, there's an absolute value involved in this. So when you have the S, that's the subtraction and a square root, and then I have a C in there, <laughs> oh crap, there's an absolute value that's got, you gotta remember that thing. Okay, so let's cover this stuff up, and you need to quiz yourself on what these mean. Cover up this, in fact. Whoop. Okay, so I'm covering these up. Don't look down at your notes. If it starts with S, you're going to have what? A square root, Whoop. one over. You're gonna have a square root and subtraction. And then which comes first? Since there's sine, that means the one comes first, just like that. Okay, what about secant? So it's gonna be one over, and then you have, it starts with an S, so there is subtraction, but it's not the I with the sign, so the one does not come first. The one comes last, and then you have X squared, and then secant, oh crap, there's an absolute value. Don't forget that thing, put an absolute value in there. And then tangent does not start with subtraction, so we just have X squared plus one, or you could say one plus X squared. All right, let's practice with this. So the derivative of sine inverse. So since it starts with sine, we're going to have one over, you have square root, I said subtraction, square root, and then you're going to have subtraction, and which one comes first, the one or the uh, the angle here? It's going to be the one since it's sine, so we have a one here. And then normally we'd say x squared, but what is this here? It's a three x, so it's going to be nine x squared. You square whatever that angle is. Now, technically you have to use uh, chain rule, so it's not done yet. Now you have to multiply by the derivative of the inside. So the derivative of 3x is just 3. So we could just then pull that 3 up to the top. Okay, erasing didn't work, so let's just put a 3. Get rid of that. So it's 3 over 1 minus 90 squared. There's our answer. Okay, next one. Tangent does not start with an s, so we don't have... Uh, we don't have subtraction and we don't have square root. So it's just going to be 1 plus or x squared plus, but we're squaring this whole angle. So that's going to be 4x to the 4th plus 1. And then it would normally be a 1 over, but we're going to multiply by the derivative of the inside to do the chain rule. So the derivative of the inside is 4x, and then that is our answer. Recognize that you cannot simplify this because you can only simplify if this was separated by multiplication. Since it's addition, this does not cancel. Okay, that is the answer. And number three, here we're going to do a secant inverse. So if you remember secant, it also has subtraction. So let's do this one over. Uh, now we have the absolute value of 5x to the sixth. And then we have the square root. So remember, the S is the square root and its subtraction, uh, but the, it's not sine, so the one comes last this time, because the sine is the one with the one in front. And then here you do whatever this angle is squared, so that's going to be 25. So 5x to the 6 times 5x to the 6 is 25x to the 12th. And then the C is the, oh crap, you got an absolute value. And then we have to do chain rule, derivative of the inside is going to be 30x to the fifth power now, subtract one. Okay, so how do we clean this up a little bit? We're gonna have a 30x to the fifth up here on top and a 5x to the sixth on bottom inside the absolute value. So here's what we'll do. I know you don't have a lot of room on this, sorry. Uh, let's go ahead and simplify. So what I'm gonna do is say that the 30 and the five is going to simplify. So the 30 is going to become a six. And then the x to the fifth is going to simplify with this x to the sixth. And there's going to be one x left. So hopefully you can see that. So let's go six over. And then we have x. I'll, let's not worry about the absolute value yet. We'll figure out in just a second if we need it. And then inside here we have 25x to the 12th minus 1. Okay, this is really the, the most difficult part is figuring out do I or do I not need this absolute value? Here's what I would do to think about this. In the original here, you would have had, I'm going to write this down here on bottom, you would have had 30x to the fifth on top, and on bottom you would have had the absolute value of 5x to the sixth with a square root of blah, 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 blah. Okay, so here's what you think about. If I were to plug in a negative one, if x equaled negative one, what's the sign? This would be negative on top, 
here, use blue, negative on top, and then you've got positive on bottom. That gives us negative and a positive makes a negative. So as long as your final answer is going to also give you a negative, if you plug in a negative 1 right there, so think about that, if you take x equals negative 1, does this answer give you negative? Yes, it does. So you do not need the absolute value. If you had positive, positive here, and you knew your final answer was going to be positive, then this would need an absolute value. Hopefully that made sense. You just kind of have to think a little bit about it before you simplified what was the answer if, you're, if you need that absolute value. Here are the other half of the trig derivatives. So I want you to notice something. What we do is you take the CO version, which stands for complementary. I don't know if you knew that, but the C and cosine, cosecant, and cotangent all stands for complementary. It's an abbreviation. So the complementary versions of the trig functions are exactly the same as the originals without the CO, without the co, except they are negative. So each one of those just has the negative symbol in front and then everything else is identical. So if we're taking derivatives and it starts with C, that is the negative version of the, uh, the original inverse trig. Okay, so pause and write that down if you don't have everything down right now. Okay, the next part is for the first time this year, we're going to talk about something called an antiderivative. Now that doesn't mean anti as in we're against something. We're not against the derivative, but it's just taking the opposite of the derivative. So we will talk a lot more about this when we get to units uh, probably 9 and 10. We'll do a lot more with these uh, inverse trig, but I want to help you understand a little now because it will this is really what you're going to see on typically see on a on a uh, an AP exam and that is if you had the derivative what in the world would the original thing be? So what would the original function be if this was a derivative? So a possible original function, if we took the antiderivative, worked backwards, since it has a square root, this is going to be starting with an s. And since the 1 came first, it is sine. So sine inverse of, okay. So this is the tricky part. If this is what the x squared is, what is the square root of 36x to the fourth? The square root of that is 6x squared. So this is probably a 6x squared. And then we can check by seeing if the chain rule was in effect. So what's the, what's the derivative of 6x squared? That would be 12x. So you can see here, this works. If you take the derivative of sine inverse of 6x squared, it gets you this thing because the chain rule would then be 12x on top. Now that's probably a little confusing because you have not had to do antiderivatives yet. Um, now technically we could also have any number we wanted. So we could have like a plus 2 or a plus 0 or a plus 3 or a plus 4 and so forth. It could be anything because if you take the derivative of a constant, you have 0. So what we're going to say in this case, just to be consistent, I know this is jumping way ahead into units 8 and 9, but we are just going to say that this could be plus any constant we wanted. Okay, so if you, I give you the, the derivative and I'm asking what's the antiderivative, you find the original inverse function and then just put a plus c because there could be any constant there we wanted. Now this brings us to the last part of our notes and that is the derivative of an inverse function. Now this is not sp specifically like a trig function, like what we've been doing before, an inverse of a trig function. It's the inverse of any general function. So when you have, let's say we just have some function f of x, then the inverse here, and we're taking the derivative of the inverse, is this crazy mess. And yes, you just have to get it memorized. Really, it's a matter of memorization. I will tell you, my trick to memorizing it is when I see the derivative of the inverse, I remember it's 1 over, and then I do the inverse. But then I have to remember that that inverse is actually on the inside of the original function. Derivative. <laughs> Shoot, that was, that was really confusing. So it's you got to remember these two things. It's 1 over the original function's derivative with the inverse function plugged in. Holy cow, is that confusing or what? Okay, write that down and I'm going to sh uh, show you how we can really get good at using this. I want to talk about some ways that the AP exam or AP problems might explain this. And they'll always start off that you have to know that f and g are inverses of each other. So this might, I'm going to give you three things real quick. These three things might be something maybe off on the left side of your note somewhere to write down. 
g of x is the inverse of f of x. Okay, that's the easiest way that they might say it, that f and g are inverses of each other. Super easy and simple. Another way will be with the notation that g of x is equal to f inverse of x. And the reason they'll do that is because then they can say that if they're asking for you to find g prime of x, you have to know that that actually means you're taking the derivative of the inverse of f. Okay, so you have to be real careful about what they're looking for here as soon as they bring up the words inverse of each other. Okay, and then the last way of, uh, of talking about this and the most confusing way is this. f of g of x will equal x, and a g of f of x will also equal x. When you have this scenario that you can plug two functions into each other and they both equal x, then they are inverses of each other. Okay, that is something that hopefully seems a little vaguely familiar to you from your pre-calculus days, uh, but that is really defining that they are inverses. So on the a lot of the practice problems that I'll give you today in the packet, you will see this because it's the most confusing way. You just have to know this really means that g and f are inverses of each other. And the reason I'm giving that to you is so that you get used to that type of notation. Okay, so let's practice with this. What I would recommend doing is writing down every time what you're really looking for. So we're going to find g of 4 and g prime of 4. So let's start off with this. Uh, how about we do g of 4 first? g of 4, what in the world does that equal? g of 4, if f and g are inverses of each other, which is what this says, f and g both uh, are going to be inverses of each other. We just talked about that. Uh, let me write down here. That means that f of something has to equal 4. Okay, that's what this is saying, g of 4, because we're going to swap the question mark and the 4. See, right there would be a question mark. We don't know what it is. So we just look up here, it's 12. Because if the y is a 4 for the function f, then 4 is the x for its inverse. So this will equal 12. Okay, now what? We're going to find the derivative of the inverse. So g is, again, it's the inverse of f, so let's do this. g prime of 4 is going to equal 1 over, stay with me on this, 1 over, so what do I do here? I'm going to have the inverse of g's derivative. The inverse of g is f, and then I do its derivative. Let me come back and look at this. See that? So if I have f inverse, then the original f, we take its derivative. So I will need its in, the inverse of g here, which is going to be f, its derivative, and then I want regular old inverse, which is g of 4. And we're trying to figure that out. Let me go back to this again. So we do f prime and then f inverse. So here it's f prime and then f inverse. That's what g is. Since we already figured out what g of 4 is, that it's 12, then we can go straight to this. We know that it's going to be 1 over f prime of 12, because g of 4 is 12. So then our last thing is that we know g prime of 4 is equal to 1 over, what's f prime of 12? f prime of 12, right here it says, is negative 5. So there it is. Negative 1 fifth is our answer. So we can box that answer, we can box that answer, there we go. All right, so this is a good time for you to pause Number six is going to be very similar to this. You pause, try this one on your own, and then I'm going to have the answer appear here in just a second. And there you have our answers. I started off first finding what g of negative 2 was, uh, and then I just, so that means if this is the y value here, it's got to be the x in the inverse. So then the x of 3 would become the y of the inverse. Uh, and then what? So then I just said, all right, we're going to take the derivative of an inverse, which means 1 over and then we do the inverse of g, which is f, take the derivative, plug in g of negative 2. Once you plug that in, you'll end up with 1 over f prime of 3, and then f prime of 3, of course, is listed right there. It is 5, so you can plug in 1 fifth. Okay, that is the end of this lesson. These are the types of problems, really, you will see maybe one or two of these on an AP exam. So it's good to get great practice at this here because it's almost guaranteed. It's super easy if you remember this formula, but if you don't remember that, near impossible to do them. All right, good luck on the rest of this packet and rock that mastery check.